Right. And the thing about that, the reason why, why it brought me to that higher level of consciousness was because it made me realize I was a sheep and why I was a sheep. It's because the character in that game was a sheep himself because he lacked the emotional capacity to be anything otherwise. And when he was no longer a sheep and he was sort of left stranded, not knowing what to do on his own, it, it broke him. And something about that just i saw it reflected back in me and my entire world was changed as a consequence welcome back to the transmission my friends and speaking of transmissions remember how when we were kids everyone over the age of 40 told us don't sit too close to the tv if you sit too close to the tv your mind is going to turn to mush and look at them now and honestly, I would argue that to an extent, just the opposite is true, that video games, anime, media of all kinds really can actually wake us up. They are capable of transmitting profound, I would say even initiatory knowledge that can change our lives. It's funny even saying that now because I think the vast majority of people would agree. Uh, I know it's true in my own case and it's clearly true in the case of our guest in this mind meld, Max Darrett. He probes deep into the philosophical and esoteric sinew of media, exposing the hidden occulted knowledge they contain on his YouTube channel. He's got some brain melting content on some of my all time favorite games, anime and TV shows. As I said, all of the above have honestly been immeasurably influential for me, so it is a pleasure to finally get to nerd out on some of this stuff on the pod. In this one, we riff on particularly influential pieces of media for both of us and how there seems to be this almost orchestrated effort to keep some of these symbols alive, an orchestrated effort to proliferate the substructure of media with certain esoteric hermetic symbols. As of course I always seem to, we also get into the huge influence of a number of eminent figures, particularly Carl Jung, when it comes to media symbolism, and much more. Quick note, Max Darrett is an anonymous content creator, so I've created something of an avatar for him, and I've added a lot more visuals than I typically do in these mind melds, not just to make up for the fact that Max has chosen to remain mysterious, but because we do get into a lot of specific pieces of media, and I thought it would be helpful to show logos, boxes, esoteric symbols when they come up in the conversation. All the links for the wise, wonderful Max Darrett are in the description. Definitely go subscribe to his channel. And of course, don't forget to boop like and subscribe here. You know how helpful it is. Speaking of subbing, do sub to Third Eye Drops wherever you listen to podcasts. I've been doing it for a number of years. We've got hundreds of audio only podcasts with brilliant human beings that will never be posted here. And many psychic smooches to those of you supporting these transmissions over on Patreon. And I hope you too, uninitiated one, will consider joining and supporting over there, but also participating because we have a patron-only Discord. We do patron-only Zoom hangs with guests you've heard on the show, a book club, and much more at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops. And with that, my friends, let's meld minds with the wise, wonderful Max Darrett. I really think we're gonna figure some things out today, my friend, because we have some really interesting overlap in a way that I think, you know, I, I have some friends and I, I'm sure listeners that fall in to a similar basket category of multifaceted, esoteric, mythopoetic interests. Mm -hmm. But the way you put some of these things together is very unique, very impressive. So I'm just excited to riff with you and see, see uh, what the... Ooh, I'm trying to think of a good al alchemical term, the union of our two opposites uh, <laughs> uh, uh, transmutes into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Uh, it seems like we're, like you were saying also before we started, that we're sort of on the same wavelength. I uh, watched a few of your videos uh, just to see where we were at in terms of the same headspace. And 
uh, it seems like we're into a lot of the same stuff. So, you know, hopefully because we know sort of the same language that we're both speaking, we might be able to uh, put some of those alchemical ingredients together and uh, <laughs> <laughs> cover new yeah. territory. Yeah. And, and it's always, uh, you know, much like, you know, to continue that metaphor, it seems like it's always a continuous process of clarifying, you know, like most people are probably generally familiar with this alchemical process of taking some sort of base metal and purifying it, transmuting it, transforming it. Uh, I, I guess the word sublimating is probably the best word, yeah. sublimating it into this something that was just a vacuous dead piece of matter to something that's somehow imbued with the essence of creation and God and enlightenment. And it seems, you know, although these, it's like a nice process that's laid out in a few stages for us by, by alchemists, really, it seems like it's a continuous ever looping process. And oh, that's gosh, what I love yeah. about these conversations, man. Is there an opportunity to like clarify further, understand a deeper level? Yeah. Yeah. Even like the, <laughs> the, alchemists of old, uh, even though there is hints of wisdom in their recipes, philosophically speaking, obviously, I don't believe in their scientific validity. Um, but, you know, if that tradition had continued uh, by trying to merge the world of value with the world of science, who knows what uh, greater things could have come of that, maybe more refined uh, things. And yeah, like we were talking beforehand about how Jung saw yeah. the psychological value in those old recipes and those old processes. Uh, but obviously they don't really make any sense, but who knows by evolving them, by adding new ingredients, who knows what can come of them. Yeah. And you know, that's the thing that, you know, it's alchemy is so shrouded in semi scientific um, language. And then also heavily, heavily mediated by, visual symbolism that it's difficult for you know i don't have a chemistry background i don't have a metallurgy background so when you see the combinations of like physical ingredients and this shifting into that it's like there it doesn't seem like there's nothing there like if you look at people like newton who became obsessed with yes me from my understanding he actually tried to recreate some of these substances and was able to come up with um like novel alloys. I saw this in a Nova documentary a while ago about huh. um, his life. So it's like there is that level. But as you and I are, I think, are more interested in beyond that level, there's like something else. There's something fundamental about the nature of reality, about the, the nature of psyche. And once you see that pattern and you start to and you feel like it's reflecting something real in your own maturation process of, you know, going from this you know, most people, a young, selfish, self-concerned being who's finding its way to the world, th through the world rather. And then as you age, you start to become more introspective. Your psyche gains an increased um, level of interiority. And you start to think, oh, this is what they're talking about, about the transformation mm. of a substance. This is how it maps over to the psyche. I yeah. feel like they're like they like the, they've known this all along and I'm just like rediscovering it. And it's so difficult to like wrap your mind around. And I, I don't think I ever would have wrapped my right mind around it, except for the fact that it's prevalent, man, prevalent as you and your videos point out throughout media, throughout video games, throughout anime, throughout movies. And that prevalence is something that I think influenced me in a way that I didn't understand from a young age. Like I didn't know what I was looking at when I would see references to like, you know, let's say hermetic terms or alchemical terms in like an RPG or something. But mm -hmm. then you see these words show up over and over again, like something as simple as philosopher's stone. You know, the first time you see it, you're just like, okay, some kind of magic stone or something. But then you see it happen over and over again. And then you start digging and you start wondering and you start seeing these connections. And you, you constantly ask yourself, am I crazy for noticing all this? Mm -hmm. But the more connections that you're able to pick up on from other artists that use the same imagery, you realize you're not. 
and you feel enlightened uh, as a consequence. By the way, what we're sort of alluding to, the, the alchemical language, the hermetic language, I don't know um, if it might be worthwhile trying to expand on what we're talking about, um, because unfortunately, even though I did watch uh, several of your videos prior to doing this, uh, I'm not sure how, like, the people that were that are listening to us talk, if uh, they know necessarily what we're referring to, or maybe we should expand yeah. upon it. Oh, yeah, I'm always up for, for clarifying and contextualizing. Okay, so um, in regards to alchemy, um, do you think it might be useful to sort of explain to people like what it is about it that could be utilized in the modern day? Absolutely. Or like it's okay. So obviously, um, just a little bit of alchemy one one for people that are listening. The reason why it died out is well, obviously. It, science came as a consequence of the enlightenment and the industrial revolution and the theory of evolution and yada, 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 all the way up into the modern day. It discredited a lot of the chemical processes that people were trying to perform during the period of the alchemists, you know, back during the, you know, Paracelsus obviously is the most famous one, Dorn, uh, Michael Mayer, although I think he was a little bit more ancient. I, I can't remember what time period it was around. And then obviously Newton, as you said, um, and, but yeah, science came along, discredited alchemy. But what happened as a consequence, science isn't necessarily interested or concerned with the world of value. It's m concerned with just getting to the objective truth of the way that the material universe works. Yeah. There's a consequence of that, though, because if morality was concerned with the way that we pursued science then we would have never enriched uranium and uh, you know, all the problems that came as a consequence. Right. Yeah. So it's like, all right, is there a way we can try and unite those two worlds, the world of objective material reality and the world of value, or are they just so completely opposed to each other that they can't be unified in a paradoxical alchemical union, right. uh, the world of the objective material with the subjective immaterial. Well, that's what the alchemists were concerned with. And, uh, well, we were talking about Jung before this. He, Carl Jung, I'm sure people who listen to you know who he is. He was concerned with alchemy because he saw within those processes the projection of the inner worlds that all human beings share via the collective unconscious onto the material world. So, for example, why is gold valuable? Right. Yeah. Why do why do human beings look at gold and see a precious metal that everybody wants? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a that's the mm -hmm. world of value coming through us into the material world. Yeah. So he tried to look at the recipes of the old alchemists, their old ideas and see what underlying psychic realities that they were trying to get at. And uh, what you will find uh, as a consequence of Jung's work is that throughout a variety of popular fiction, uh, the same ideas interlaced uh, in video games, anime. We were talking about Full Metal Alchemist beforehand. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most wonderful uses of that old imagery. And the more that you dig into these, you, you just see the same language, uh, the same artists trying to get at the underlying truth that lies at the bottom of all of our psyches that are, you know, we're trying to project onto alchemy and it's beautiful. It's, it's poetry. And I, and I think, you know, that, that historical kind of scorched earth mentality that came as a result of the enlightenment, you know, meaning let's do away with all of the superstition. Let's do away with all of this mumbo jumbo symbolism. This is all a bunch of superstitious bullshit. Well, people, it, people, it, no, some no, of it is. It, it totally. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And that's the beauty of, like you pointed out, a young, because he's like, you know, I just, I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a doctor. I'm a scientist, but I just cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater here. I know there's more to, to psyche, to dreams, to strange happenings, paranormal things that I can't quite explain. Mm. And you know what? I think the ancients were onto this. And I think 
ancient systems, alchemy, hermeticism, Kabbalah, all are trying to hint at some deeper truths about the nature of reality in a way that actually science to an extent is consistent with, or at least in a way that they can coexist, you know, at, yes. at least in a way where the, the more mythopoetic language that Jung later became, you know, really obsessed with, as you're pointing out through alchemy, in a way that they they almost have to coexist. Because I remember him in um, Man and His Sibyls talking about, you know, I don't, I don't reach for conversations about myth and alchemy because I want to. I do it because I have to. Like there's no, there's nothing in the scientific process that accounts for strange dreams, that accounts for strange, almost like ESP type events and synchronicities that I've had in my own life. So what other language can I use to talk about it other than myth, symbol, alchemy, et cetera? So, and that's, and that's what always turns me on about Jung is that not only is he interested in, the, in these things, but he is deeply educated in the Western analytical yeah. sense as well. And I'm always looking for those people that, that again, alchemically, are kind of marrying the two to sort of extract the ultimate wisdom um, from, both, from both ways of thinking. Yeah, and he was sort of like the last person that really did that. Uh, and uh, people like you and I, I suppose, are trying to carry on his tradition. I guess the way that I try to do it is just by trying to apply it to popular media. And uh, who knows, maybe something good can come out of that where the world of the subjective can be recognized and validated. But it's uh, going to take a while. The uh, enlightenment for all the wonderful things that it brought, it did almost obliterate the... Uh, you know, recognizing that world of the subjective as something that is real. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it did. It, it did a lot of lasting damage. And and it also, in a, in a for, unfortunate way, really solidified dogma and literalism because it made people think there's either objective truth or, or untruth. So instead of looking at these ancient wisdom traditions for what, what I believe they are, and I'm guessing you believe they are, as these sort of allegorical, metaphorical, symbolic representations of things that are deeply true archetypally about reality, yes. but at the yes. same time are not literally true about material reality, at least in a way that, you know, your typical really dogma thumping literalist would interpret it as. So that even like exacerbates the issue of trying to marry these two ways of thinking and looking at the world. And I think there's some some uh, damage that needs to be undone in that respect too. Right. Um, one of the things I definitely want to ask you, man, is growing up, the first time you really encountered a deep piece of media that piqued your interest, that pulled you in, maybe even in a way where you didn't understand at the time, but it just felt almost like a gravity well of, holy shit, this is speaking to something deeply in my soul. And I don't know what it is, but I just like more of this, more of this. Do, do you remember like the first game you ever played or first thing you ever watched that really did that for you? Um, yes, but I, I can't say that it was necessarily something that was steeped in that type of uh, spiritual symbolism. Um, I've never really told anybody this story before, but hmm. I, I suppose it, it's something I've always wanted to talk about, but it's deeply personal, but I suppose it, it it's the best example I can point to. Um, the most, the one, <laughs> interestingly enough, the one video game that I'm most known for talking about on my channel, it's my most popular video, uh, is on a video game called Metal Gear Solid 2. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that game doesn't deal with the sort of stuff that we were talking about beforehand. But I do remember there's a moment at the end of that game that I really don't know how else to put it, but it brought me to consciousness. It, I, I, when, I tell, when I have told this story to people in my personal life, I, I preface it by saying I know the first moment that I actually became conscious. 
Wow. Because prior to that, I had lived a very unconscious, sheepish life where I, you know, I tried to live by the wishes of my parents and my elders, but I never really thought for myself. But then I played Metal Gear Solid 2. It, it was, I was 16. Uh, it was the summer of 2010. And I played Metal Gear Solid 2, but I never really played it. I never really understood what I was playing until that moment. And then at the end of that game, without spoiling it, something happens where the main character, he has been led to believe that certain things were happening in a way, except they weren't. And things were sort of flipped back on him uh, by the villains of the game. And they said things to him that made me, I I don't know how to explain this. No. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really, I I totally understand what you mean by awakening because it is like the Plato's cave sort of allegory. It is the Neo finally seeing the matrix moment. Yes. Holy shit. Everything I thought about the world is not true. The supposed Mm -hmm. order of things is not the supposed order of things. And I've been, well, I guess he was literally a pawn, but you know, if not a pawn, then like you said before, a sheep who did not really understand the depth of what was going on here the whole time. Right. And the thing about that, the reason why why it brought me to that higher level of consciousness was because it made me realize I was a sheep and why I was a sheep. It's because the character in that game was a sheep himself because he lacked the emotional capacity to be anything otherwise. And when he was no longer a sheep and he was sort of left stranded, not knowing what to do on his own, it broke him. And when I, the main character Raiden from Metal Gear Solid 2, and when that happened to him and I saw his progression throughout the series after that, something about that just, I saw it reflected back in me. And my entire world was changed as a consequence. Mm-hmm. It's it's a much more complicated story. And there's a lot darker elements that I'm hoping to put into a book someday. Mm-hmm. But anyways, to transition from that into something back to what we were talking about before, left stranded, not, you know, with this newfound consciousness and not knowing how to orient myself, I didn't really know where to go. But video games actually played a great role in trying to reorient me and give my life greater meaning. And the game that I found that the most in was Silent Hill. Mm. And if you want a game that has, that pays tribute to the alchemical traditions, the psychoanalytic traditions, um, and a bunch of other stuff, Silent Hill is by far the best place to go. It's a constant dive into the symbolism of the unconscious mind and the amount that's there and the depth and the brilliance with which it's used. It's something that I've been able to pull from for the last several years, and it has guided me to other games and other media that had the same symbolism and made me realize, hey, all these other great artists, they're on the same pathway that you and I are on. There is legitimacy to it. And there can be great meaning that can be extracted from it, sustaining yeah. meaning. Yeah. Yeah. And I played I played both of those franchises growing up as well. Metal nice. Gear, for sure. That series is one of my favorite series of all time. And although the trappings are different, you know, stylistically, it, it's not it doesn't look esoteric or hermetic or alchemical. But I do I really do think that everything we're talking about in these games is following the same beats of the hero's journey or oh, yeah. a transmutation where you have this main character who sort of just is acting as the prima materia. They're coming into the story, not knowing what's going on. They think the world is one way and suddenly they're plunged into this dark night of the soul, which is, you know, the first step of the alchemical journey, the negretto, the blackening. And it's just chaos. It's dealing with chaos and trying to make sense of chaos. And then slowly through those same stages, coming to a a new understanding, awakening, seeing the world in a different way. And yeah, Silent Hill, man, it's been so long since I've played one of those games, but I remember it by far being, so this comes out of the survival horror genre where, you know, it's, it was very popular, but probably not as popular as Resident Evil, but very popular. But I remember 
Resident Evil not really scaring me, but Silent Hill scared the shit out of me because oh, yeah. it really, I mean. Dude, I played that game when I was six. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, yeah, that you're not ready. You're not ready. Mm -hmm. um, for people who have never played it, imagine, you know, you're you're just, they always start where it's a guy who's driving and then he gets in some kind of accident and he gets stranded in this town that is essentially like possessed, demonic, wild shit is going on where essentially like a hell realm is morphing into regular oh, consensus wow. reality. So you'll just be like walking through a school and then the school will just change and morph into a shadow version of itself with like just gore and demons and like flesh on the, the ground. Walls. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, and and you know you're you're left not only trying to survive but solve the mystery of what's going on. And then this it gets into like ritual magic concepts and like goetic demons and you know mm. just um all of this different kind of occult and esoteric terminology that I, that game may actually now that we're talking about it that may have been the first time that i was introduced to certain you know names of of demons and certain concepts that you know if you if you dig into this stuff you'll you'll definitely come across um can, but, can we provide yeah, an course. example for people that might have never played yeah. silent hill mm -hmm. so one thing um that i the concept of god if god does in fact exist and what all the hermetic traditions try to do to explain what god really is it takes on a similar form in silent hill so the way that i and the other hermeticists tend to perceive God seems to be, and this is a term we were using before, somewhat of a union of opposites. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, if all of reality unfolded from God, that means it's God was all of existence, including all of its opposites, good and bad, life and death, up and down, left and right, all of that united within one being. In Silent Hill, God actually shows up and when it does it the perception of that god depends like, as it comes into our real world it does depend on the person perceiving it mm -hmm. sometimes it can show up as a heavenly being as we see in silent hill one spoiler alert the game's over 20 years old <laughs> but uh the main form that it takes, because, you know, the people that happen to be in Silent Hill tend to have some sort of darkness within them, it does take on a demonic form. And that demonic form is Baphomet. Yeah. Now, Baphomet, for people who don't know anything about that, was an attempt by a 19th century magician named Eliphas Levy to try and describe what the infinite is, what God is, what the unself of the Kabbalists is, essentially. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the way, if you look at a picture of Baphomet, particularly the one that Eliphaz Levy produced, it is the infinite being with all of you know the opposites of life described on it. So, for example, Baphomet, you'll have one arm pointing up, but the other arm pointing down. You'll have male and female parts. You'll be human, but also an animal. There's the, you know, I, I think it's the sun and the moon, or it might be like mm -hmm. a full moon and a half moon, something like that, in that picture, trying to describe what the infinite is. And Silent Hill does the exact same thing. And, per, and you know, appropriately, God tends to show up at the end of the game when you've completed that alchemical journey. So one yeah. of many examples. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, that's incredibly, uh, like, it's such an ambitious thing to try to do, period. Oh, yeah. But to try to do it in like a PlayStation 1 game. You know, it's like people have been for some, and we, we started to touch on this before we recorded a little bit, but for some strange reason, regardless of the type of media, whether it's a book, whether it was an 8-bit or 16-bit game or throughout you know the co console generations at this point i don't think that i could find many single overlapping things about those games uh, you know other than you know certain like genre tropes or whatever other than 
almost obsessively, perhaps unconsciously, telling these same stories over and over and over again. And one question I have for sure that I, I don't think is answerable, but I would love mm -hmm. to hear you riff on if you have any insight into this is, is it conscious or unconscious in a lot of these cases? Like, do you think the creators of, you know, RPG series or Silent Hill or uh, MGS not with, notwithstanding because Kojima is absolutely like on some very deep <laughs> levels, the guy who created that game, there's no mm -hmm. doubt in my mind, but um, how much of it do you think is conscious and how much of it do you think is unconscious? And are there any interesting examples that you know of, of creators that have like publicly stated or have clearly shown their, their knowledge, or do you think it's just people playing with certain <laughs> symbols, semi, semi knowledgeably maybe, but not really knowing largely what they're doing? Well, okay. So the majority of the time, it seems to be with at least the anime that the anime the the media that i've come across the inclusion is consciously done mm -hmm. but there are a variety of other instances where maybe it is unconscious or maybe sometimes <laughs> there are circumstances where the author will say oh it doesn't mean anything but that's absolutely not true for example yeah. uh neon genesis evangelion the symbolism in that show don't listen to anything that the creators say it absolutely means something and it's provable uh that's, wild, that's just one yeah. example but yeah in regards to whether or not it's unconscious i don't know i i have uh, going back to silent hill Obviously, a lot of the stuff in there is uh, is consciously put in there. But then there are other things where the symbolism, it, it's, it's trying to symbolize something. But there's not enough information there for people to really determine what they mean. And so you have to sort of speculate. And I wonder... So, sorry, I'm having a hard time. It, it, this is the problem when you're trying to explain subjective you know. symbols with little information. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example from Silent Hill 2. There is a save point uh, where you go to save your game in the middle of the game. And it's designated by just a plain red square. And whenever the main character encounters it, he says touching it or coming into contact with it, it's like something is rearranging his brain. Mm. What the heck does that mean? Well, it's not at all. Uh, it, it's really something that you have to sort of come up with on your own. Uh, I theorize because of the first game's uh, reference to alchemical concepts that maybe the square was similar because the square in alchemy represents consciousness uh, and, you know, red represents the gift of consciousness, you know, the philosopher's stone. Oh, yeah. um, and, you know, the entire point of Silent Hill 2 is that the main character is trying to remember something. Mm. And by the time he reaches the end of the game, you know, there's one safe point near the end of the game where all the safe squares, like a whole bunch of them are plastered up on the wall. Like, hey, you finally came to consciousness it sort of symbolizes that. So I theorize that maybe that was a consciously made, but then again, the guy who I think included a lot of that alchemical symbolism in Silent Hill one, he wasn't there for Silent Hill two. Mm. So was that something that was done that carried over somehow? Was there a discussion like, hey, this is what this means? Or did it just sort of come out autocathonously? Yeah. I don't yeah. know. There are, that's just, I, I can probably think of a bunch of other examples that are easier to explain, but that was just the one that first came to mind. And I, sorry if that no, was a little bit that's obscure. Not at all. No, it's super interesting. Okay. And, you know, it, it makes me think too, you know, going, going back to Jung, like maybe it almost doesn't matter how conscious it is because these archetypes find a way, like they find a way to just bubble up into the, into the unconscious mind 
through symbols, through dreams, through little, you know, I think I should do something like this, or maybe I should put in something like, you know, it, it comes to your conscious yes. mind this way. Like, oh, maybe I'll just do something like this. But you're it's blind more, to the yes. actual origin of where that idea came from. And uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. It's more interesting. Uh, I I would, I wish that, <laughs> I, I understand why artists don't want to reveal their intentions because it's more interesting that way. But I would love to find a, an artist, I'd love to talk to one of the original creators of Silent Hill and have them yeah. say, I genuinely didn't mean for it to be this way. But then I would ask them, okay, what do you think about this interpretation and then see what they say? It's like, hmm, yeah. maybe that did come out uh, from within somewhere and it does actually apply. Yeah. That would be more right. interesting. Yeah. 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 I, I think, I mean, I even see, you know, I, I try to think of, you know, looking at my own life creatively as I've aged. One of the things I used to be in bands and play music and I was always trying to write really epic evocative lyrics but when i go back like just the other day i did the stupid like i want to listen to this thing i haven't listened to it in a while and just in a way it's it's almost like you're looking at yourself cringily but also oh this it's kind of cute and oh i see what i was trying to do here but every now and then i'll surprise myself with whoa i was reaching for that I don't know if mm. I was even conscious of that at that time or knew how to talk about it properly, but I see what I was going for there. And I, I wonder if that is kind of what's happening at times within media where they, oh, yeah. they, they, they might kind of know what they're doing, but they don't fully know what they're doing. And that, that begs so many questions, you know, about, where ideas come from and the nature of reality and what, you know, how, you know, this is one of the things I've seen young play with a lot in the red book in particular. Yep. Where Which he says, based his entire basis of theories on, by the way. The yeah. Red book. Right, right, right. So I think most people listening know about the red book at this point, because it's something I, I mention fairly frequently, but it's this incredible work of, of art and like calligraphy and mythopoetic musings and visionary experiences that Jung actually went through in a very kind of dark night of the soul period in his own personal life after he had the falling out with uh, Freud. And if you look at this thing, it is just an incredible multifaceted work of psychology and art and, and mythology and alchemy and all of these things. And I sort of lost my train of thought of why I brought this up again. Oh no, I, I, it was because yeah. it was because it, somewhere in the red book, I believe he says something to the effect of we're being lived by forces. We don't understand we're being lived by forces. And I'm always just that line always stuck out to me as just something really potent and kind of vexing because it just makes, it just makes you wonder how much control you as an individual really even have you know do people have ideas or do ideas have people yeah yeah do, are you familiar with um there's a part where he encounters philemon the wise old man archetype and do you remember what philemon says about ideas no i don't please remind me he says something to the effect of um you think ideas are yours but they're more like animals in a forest or birds in the sky or something to that effect, where it's just like, you think these things are yours, but really they're a priori existing and you're just sort of catching them or noticing them more oh, yeah. or less. And it's our goal, I think as humans, as conscious beings to not have the ideas bend us to their will, mm. but for us to integrate them and bend them to our will. And then when we get to the point where, uh, I don't know, if it's in this lifetime, which would probably be only something accomplished by maybe like mythical figures like Jesus and Buddha, or over the course of many lifetimes, then when we bring all those ideas into our control, maybe you achieve that level of divinity. Yeah. So, you know oh, I mean? you, well, you, oh, yeah, for sure. I, I definitely, I definitely know what you mean. Because it, it always does feel like it's just it almost is takes some sort of 
impossible mythological act to ever really get to that kind of a point. Um, oh, I was going to ask you this. Have you ever heard of the sort of myth of the hidden it has it has different names, but like the like the, the hidden white lodge or the just the hidden lodge or the secret brotherhood. Have you have you ever heard read into any of this stuff? Uh, what what you mean like the Golden Dawn? Similar, kind of similar. Okay. So no, it, it's yeah. it's 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 essentially that there is this secret network of people that have been since antiquity keeping the sort of hermetic alchemical, you know, Egyptian, probably pre-Egyptian line of esoteric wisdom alive, but mm -hmm. they stay hidden. They stay completely hidden. And that's one of the things that, you know, in my more conspiratorial, more, you know, red pilly moments, it would connect a lot of dots in terms of what we're talking about, in terms huh. of why these things sort of just stay right in the little symbolic substructure of media. But then I look, but then, you know, if you probably look at your own life and I look at my own life, no one had to tell me to be interested in these things. I was just interested in them. So that that's probably the more likely Occam's razor. But, but yeah, I wanted to throw that your way. <laughs> uh, whether or not like an actual society like that exists. Um, it, it's, I don't know. It's, interesting i would say like well the golden dawn uh, the hermetic order uh that existed i think in the last century uh, they maybe tried to do something like that uh but whether or not they were able to m do something sort of consistent what the original magicians tried to do like we were talking about before where they actually tried to take magic and unify it with objective science because it seems to me like as much as the Golden Dawn did operate using a lot of the imagery that we talked about, it didn't really seem to be, it, it, it seemed to be more like a fad. Uh, I might be wrong about that. Though. Yeah. But as far as like actual societies that make use of this ancient knowledge, I don't know, maybe, who knows? <laughs> I, yeah. I, I can't point to anything, but it, it's an interesting thought. And as far as, you know, just to quickly circle things back to video games. It's a, it's an idea that uh, certain video games I've played have uh, theorized about. Have you ever heard of a game called Control? No. Okay. That's a game that came out about four years ago. It's made by the same guy that did Alan Wake and Max Payne. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he, oh, he's like huge into Jungian mm. symbolism. He even, you know, calls certain enemies in his games the shadow. And mm. it is the actual Jungian shadow. Dude, if you played that game, you would be, it'd be like Candyland for you. It was for yeah. me. Cool, so, cool. But, and I, the I whole, play, yeah, I did. Sorry, play the Alan, whole, I was going to say, I just played Alan Wake, but yeah, for sure. Yeah, good call. Well, Alan Wake and Control, they share the same universe. And uh, oh, okay. it's not a spoiler. This is the whole basis of the game Control. It's about uncovering this secret governmental society that deals with this world of the subjective and how it bleeds into our world and trying to map it. And they actually make reference to Jungian ideas. Like there are documents you can pick up in the game that refer to the collective unconscious, uh, archetypal ideas and how archetypes bleed into our world. It's so cool. Wow. That's yeah. super cool. Yeah, man. It's, it's really compelling. I, I think the first time I ever came out across that idea other than, I mean, I think everybody, has this notion that there could be some hidden group orchestrating things, whether it's the Illuminati or New World Order or whatever, like language you want to wrap around it. I think the first time I ever encountered this idea of there being a secret hermetic lineage that spanned all the way back to ancient Egypt or maybe even like uh, antediluvian, you know, pre-flood, whatever, is um, Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall. He, he, there's like a whole section of that book that deals with Egypt and like the origin of the supposed hermetic um, initiations and wisdom and stuff like that and how it relates to uh, the pyramids and et cetera, et cetera. And then hmm. he, that, that whole section sort of ends with, you know, and the, the lore is that there were these, like there, you know, everyone knows there's this corpus of hermetic doctrine that still exists to some extent this day, to this day, but much of it has been lost 
but there's supposed to be like a certain amount of books, like 40 whatever books, and only this many survive. But there is a group who is aware of the full breadth of the knowledge, and they sort of like seed the wisdom quietly and they'll make themselves known one day but not right now like that that's the sort of that's the sort yeah of it. it's not a crazy idea like i i know that there are people out there that are aware of the lineage of those old hermetic teachings like i think in our email exchange we were talking about alan moore oh yeah right yeah, yeah he's one of those like he if you read his book promethea that entire story references all the core concepts from hermetic teachings going all the way back to ancient Egypt with the figure of Hermes Trismegistus, uh, Hermes Thoth, and trying to demonstrate how it uh, carries through into present day. I I have no doubt that there are individuals, influential individuals that are aware of these teachings. I just, and because of that, I'm not entirely opposed to the idea of there being like a secret society that's trying to find the link between the two. But I don't know, like, I, I, I'd like to see the evidence for it. But Manly P. Hall, that's what his name is? Yeah, yeah. So he, he man, he's, you're, you're going to love diving into him. Okay. He, he was this multi dis he, he was just this genius by who, so he wrote this book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages in the Early 20th Century. And it really is an impressive, you know, thick tome of wisdom the world over from ancient Greek to Egyptian to Eastern ideas and uh, uh, Masonic ideas and all of all these different schools and kind of combining it all together and analyzing the central themes. And dude, he wrote this book in his early 20s. It's <laughs> mind boggling. It's a thick, you know, I don't remember, six, 700, 800 page book. Um that just exhaustively goes through all of this stuff and it's still readable. It's still relevant. I'm sure a lot of the scholarship in air quotes doesn't hold up currently to our current historic understanding of certain things or dates or whatever, but it's still an immense impressive repository of ideas. And it's almost kind of like an encyclopedia in a way, but it's more, it's not like a breakdown of specific terms. It's more like, you know, general headings of, of philosophers and times in history and schools of thought, et cetera. But it's a, just a great resource to have. And I'm sure it would, I'm sure it would spark a lot of things for you. And it would it'd just be a really good resource for when you come across things too. And you're doing, you know, like, Oh, I wonder if there's anything in secret teachings of all ages about this. Oh, turns out there is, you know, there in, in more, in more often than not, at least it seems to be the case. Yeah. But. Well, I bet, yeah. That's actually, I'm definitely going to, try and download that on my iPad uh, when we're done, because that sounds fascinating. I've been trying to get a hold of a sort of like a French version of that, because Mm -hmm. a a friend of mine who lives in France, uh, I can't remember the name of the author of the book, but I I was trying to get a hold of it because it was a a compilation of like symbols and their meaning uh, from a French psychoanalyst. Hmm. But it's written in French, and thankfully I speak some French, uh, so I could read it. But it, having this, hearing about this, and I'm assuming it's in English, yeah. uh, will be a whole lot better. So thank you. Yeah. No. No problem, man. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I, in a lot of ways, you know, I guess he. It's weird to think because I because he was so young when he wrote it. I'm not. I don't. I'm guessing the ideas of young probably were not super prevalent yet, because I, I think. Young's old own journey into this was, you know, going more so down the straight and narrow younger in life and then coming more to these topics that you and I are so obsessed with later on in life. Yeah. But um, but yeah, man, that would have been just figures that I would love to hear converse or love just to get together and talk about topics. My God, man, my God. And there there are um there are lectures you can find by Hall, too. Like there's tons of free lectures on uh, Spotify, YouTube. He's got some great stuff. And and he really saw the way that things were going in terms of like humanity needing to find a new, very similarly to Young, in that although we're sort of on the other side of the scientific enlightenment, there is all of the spiritual common ground. There are central ideas we can gather around 
and sort of use these ideas to buttress and propel society in a positive direction. And he even like gets into like space, like how space faring and, you know, um, kind of spreading consciousness and wisdom and life across the cosmos is also a spiritual calling and, and mm. stuff of that nature. And um, yeah, he's, he's great. He's really great. Awesome. And he has a very gentle, a gentleness about him. You know, he's not one of these weird uh, esotericists that you're like, I would not be surprised if you're drinking blood inside of a pentagram. Like <laughs> in, he's in, not your, crowley type. Yeah. Yeah. But we can't skip over um, Alan Moore, man, Alan Moore. Oh my God. Another one of these figures, yeah. like you just pointed out, that is just the level of wisdom is so deep and that that graphic novel series in particular it might be a little more obscure than some of his more popular stuff like Watchmen, of course. But um, but yeah, Promethea is really incredible. I've only read the first volume of it, mm. but it's it's incredibly Volume Beautiful. two is where yeah. it really cool. picks up, man. Like cool. he, cool. Uh, without spoiling anything, just a general synopsis. Um, Promethea is the main character. Uh, well, Sophie Banks is the main character, but anyways, uh, she goes into the world of the subjective, um, like I guess what the Gnostics would call the pleroma or uh, what Jung would call the unconscious. And, uh, her journey through that follows it's like going up the tree of life from Kabbalah from mm -hmm. the Malchus state all the way up to the Kether crown state. And it's so trippy, but it's so cool. Um, unfortunately, uh, because it is so laden with esoteric imagery, I think that's part of the reason why it wasn't as popular because people would be like, wait, I feel like I'm being lectured to rather than reading a story. But for people like you and I, who understand what Moore is getting at, mm -hmm. it's profound in the most accurate sense of the word. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, you know, Moore with all of his work, it, it's very multifaceted. It might be, might be disingenuous to try to boil it all down to one thing. But what do you think Moore is trying to do with his work? Do you think he's trying to weave magical principles into his work in such a way to almost like cast a spell or do you think it's a little less you know direct than that and that he's just trying to communicate these central themes and ideas or what are your thoughts uh on that? i think it's mostly him trying to bring the world of meaning and value back to the forefront instead of making the universe as we understand it, just one based around objective materialism and devoid of value. Although I will say more is enough of uh, an eccentric figure where I, I wouldn't put it past him to try and cast a spell over everybody. I mean, he yeah. did try to convince everybody that the world was going to end uh, six years ago. So, but you know, look what came from that. But what, what was the story with that? Um, I, I don't know how he came to make that particular prediction. Uh, he just said it was going to end in 2017. Oh, oh no, wait, no, I remember. He actually lays this out in Promethea. He said that humanity's knowledge had been growing at such an exponential rate oh, okay. that at some point it was going to reach a apo apotheosis. And when that happened, the world would end. And he, I don't know how he made this particular calculation, but he said it was going to be 2017. Hmm. But I mean look where we are but who knows maybe when ai comes about and we birth ai jesus or something he'll deliver us and the world will end <laughs> yeah right <laughs> that's a conversation i've had on my channel uh but well that's, that's an yeah. that's an interesting union of opposites idea right there because right now we see that technology as an other right this is digital mm -hmm. we're analog that's silicon we're meat but there is going to come a point where the two merge and we see it as us probably implementing a tool, an adjunct to our consciousness. But, and, and, and I think that that's more true. I, I'm not, I'm not as much of a sentient AI person for reasons we can definitely get into if you want to, but, um, but it could be just for the sake of fun. It could be that it sees us as a means to evolve as well. And what happens when these two forces seeking evolution 
combine. You know, that mm. that really could be a, a, like a some sort of strange moment of transmutation. Have you ever played Deus Ex? Only a little bit. I'm not well enough to know like the 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 full gravity. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I'm just bringing it up because what you were just saying there about what would happen when the the natural world and the mechanical world combine to create something more divine. Deus Ex deals exactly with that, and mm. uh, it does it so well that, with one exception, I think it's the most profound game ever made. Um, I do put Nier Automata yeah. above it just a little bit, but man, Deus Ex 1 is really damn good, and it deals with that exact same subject. Yeah, and I, I did play Nier, but I didn't finish it, so that's mm. one that I've meant to go back and play, because it is it does have just this amazing atmosphere and you can tell there's so much more going on underneath the surface, but I didn't even really get to the part where you start to put the pieces together, but, but yeah, that's mm -hmm. a great, just a really great game too. Yeah. But anyways, uh, back to more, um, what is he trying to do? Yeah. <clears throat> he actually outlines this a little bit in Promethea. It is just him trying to demonstrate that. Look, he does not deny the, value that comes from reason and science and the benefits that it has brought the world. But what we have lost, and we talk about this right at the very beginning, what we have lost as a consequence is a belief in the existence of the subjective, of the world of value, of the immaterial. And what it seems he's trying to do by mixing and matching all these different uh, esoteric images from Kabbalah, from tarot, from alchemy, as he does in Promethea, is demonstrate that, look, there is something at, at root at the bottom of all these images, and it would do well for humanity the world over to meditate on them, to re-experience them and remember why these images held such value in our consciousness before. And hopefully, by being able to unite those two worlds, uh, which is, by the way, something that Ellie Feslavi also wanted to do, which is unite the world of the subjective of magic with science, then the new aeon will begin. <laughs> yes, yes, that's a powerful, mm -hmm. a powerful image right there, and a rich one too, with a lot of different ways we could approach that question. But oh, I, just one yeah, other thing, very quickly on that matter, uh, if you want uh, something that will give you nightmares for the rest of your life. And it's on that very same subject of trying to unite the world of value with science. Uh, you can read Carl Jung's collected works 9.2, which is titled Ion. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that book will permanently rearrange the way that your brain uh, operates. <laughs> it's the red square. It's a red square. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, oddly enough. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, oh, the, the red book. Woo. Oh, there's a synchronicity. Red square. Yeah, yeah. Red book, ion. And the red book, but also like the ion text, the physical text that I have is actually red and square. So. Ooh. Ooh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm so tempted to just keep going down rabbit holes, but I want to ask you, I guess, more personally as sure. somebody who's encountered all this information, synthesized all this information, and I find too, man, making content about this stuff, writing about this stuff helps solidify your own thinking and your own thoughts and perhaps even beliefs because you really have to say something. You know, like when you decide to make something, it goes from thinking, considering ethereal and up here to putting it down on paper to publishing it on YouTube for, for you hundreds of thousands of people a lot of the time or millions sometimes. And so you got to really understand what you think or what you suspect. And yeah. through synthesizing all of this, how has your personal philosophy recoagulated? And, you know, what is it? How would you describe it now? Do you believe, quote unquote, certain things about the nature of reality? Do you, or suspect, or do you, do you, <laughs> do you choose any certain mouth noises with how you, um, identify yourself in that respect? Um, <laughs> that's, um, that's a broad question, man. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's impossible to, it's definitely the case that 
by going on this journey that I've been on with YouTube, by trying to find the underlying meaning that various artists are trying to get at through their art, specifically through video games, but I've also talked about anime and TV, that my perception of the world has changed. To what degree and how it influences my belief, um, it's hard to say. Even though I'm very interested in the world of the subjective and all this esoteric imagery, I, I do still struggle with trying to determine how quote unquote real it is. Mm -hmm. I suppose you could say that in respect to some things that I have learned, I act as if they are true, but I, I, I struggle to say whether or not I believe that they're true. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, what's a good example? Oh, well, the whole notion to, to sort of demonstrate what I'm getting at, the whole notion of unifying opposites that's at the core of alchemy, of alchemical doctrine. Yeah. I call myself an alchemist and I have on my channel primarily for that reason, because I believe that anything that can be done to further unify opposite elements is the right way to go and not to drive them apart. And so like whenever it comes to any sort of polar opposites, this is how I approach politics, for example, I yeah. try to find ways where I don't exacerbate the tensions, but I try to hear both sides and find ways where I can bring them together. So in that sense, I act as if divinity as a union of opposites is true, but is it true? Right. Yeah. Who knows? Is it is it ontolo like ontologically true? Is there really something out there in existence that this is all speaking to? Or is it just some artifact of the human psyche, some way that we're compelled to think for some strange reason that we can't quite explain? Maybe it just stems from our fear of death or our, you know, a sort of like par pareidolia where we're always looking for a pattern, for a something, for a reason. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I think and as thinking person you have to leave possibilities for both but i i definitely share your your interest and obsession with with digging into it mm -hmm. yeah, yeah what were you gonna say i was gonna say you have to consider the possibilities at all times about whether or not what you're thinking about is true or not yeah so that way you don't get you know you don't fall into the down the path of dogma or uh, ideological sheepism. Um, yeah. But, it, and it's harder. It's a more difficult path, but it's the more rewarding path. And uh, I would much rather be on this path than any other. A thousand percent, man. A thousand percent. It, it reminds me of like, there's that quote from Jung about, it, it sounds like every time you say it, it sounds like you're so full of yourself, but it's something to the effect of like, being like, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something to the effect of like the wise man is lonely because of how much he knows. It's like the more, the more knowledge you accumulate and the more you try to synthesize it and make sense of it, the more difficult it becomes to reach a final answer. And the more alienated you begin to feel from traditional ways of thinking about the world as a result, because you know, nothing's that simple. You know, it's not as simple as like these cartoonish binary politics that we have going on in the Western world, you know, it's not as simple as like, there's either a God or there's not, you know, it's yeah. not as, simple as there's either consciousness or there's not it, There's all of these like just ex extraordinarily nuanced, complex, deep questions that are roiling around in your head. And the more you look for answers, the more intense, the like lack of clarity becomes in a certain way, because you're always adding new factors, new spices, and it's creating more gray area, you know, and, but, but that is the way of the, you know, it's again, to sound so cheesy, but that is the way of the philosopher, right? Like that is the way of like loving wisdom as that word literally means it's like, if you want wisdom, you can have it, but it's a Pandora's box and there's yeah. going to be more, there's going to be more and there's gonna be more questions. Look at what happened to Jesus. Look how yeah. uh, the world treated him for, uh, you know, the pathway that he took. Exactly. Exactly. Um,
when you decided to do YouTube and dive in to these kinds of topics, what was like the first video of this kind that you did that you were like, I'm going to do this. This is a new thing for me, but I can't, I can't not do it. Um, well, uh, there's two answers to that. When I first realized that I was, I had some aptitude at being able to explain some difficult concepts for people. It was when a video game called inside came mm-hmm. out in 2016 great game uh it's very short to get through and the entire story is conveyed purely through images there's no dialogue in the game and you know as a consequence people are like wait what happened exactly so i i did a video explaining it and for the longest time that was my most popular video i think it's almost at two million views nice and i thought to myself huh and this was actually during the period of time where i that I was referring to earlier on where I was sort of in that unconscious daze and not really knowing which way to take my life. And then with that, you know, getting over a million views in such a short time, it's just like, huh. And and people responding positively. It's like, maybe I can do something like this. And then I thought, "Hmm, well, what other video games do I want to pursue uh, and investigate? Well, the, the first one was Silent Hill. And as far as, you know, realizing that the world of the esoteric and the meaningful was something that I would have to pursue. The first time that I actually discovered that uh, was with Silent Hill. And it was with my third video on the game. And it was on the subject of synchronicity. Mm. So it was around that time. I, I struggled to remember exactly how I learned about the concept of synchronicity. But I, the important thing is I recognized how it was applicable to Silent Hill. Because the whole, I'm simplifying it, but one of the core elements of synchronicity is a belief that the products of our mind have some sort of material basis to them. And in Silent Hill, you see the products of various characters' mind come to life. And the more that I pursued that, it led me to Jung, who originally posited the theory of synchronicity and Jung's theories, maybe realized that there was a whole bunch of other, you know, uses of his theories in regards to other video games, like Control, the aforementioned Control, Xenogears, a whole bunch of others. And I am where I am now because of that. (laughs) Yeah, that's another game I played growing up. That's a great example of a game that I knew was playing with some just really, really hot pieces of nomenclature with a lot of (laughs) steering wisdom, but I did not understand. And I would, I'm going to watch your Xenogears video actually, because I, I probably won't go back and play it again fully, but I will for sure. I would like to extract the juice from that. You know, I I, I would assume, oh, I also need to dive into your Elden Ring videos, man, because I've, I've played through that too. And that, that more than any other game, the lore is incredibly rich and deep and impenetrable, just Mm -hmm. impenetrable to try to understand what's going on just by playing the game. Unless you're going around picking up items, like really reading descriptions of every single item you pick up. And man, that's talk about an alchemical journey. You have to pay attention to every little detail to figure out what the hell is going on. Same thing for dark souls. Did you ever watch my videos on dark souls? I haven't. No. Okay. Dude, that's the first. Okay. Yeah. 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 The, Dark Souls in particular, and, and Elden Ring, all, all the From Software games, including Bloodborne, also have a lot of that alchemical imagery. Uh, what's a, an example? Did, did you finish Elden Ring? I did, yeah. Okay. Are you familiar with the concept of the alchemical rebus? Yeah, that's that's like that's a later point in the transformation, and it's like represented by a and, androgyne, right? Where there's like yeah. a man woman two-headed thing exactly well yeah. who are america and radagon oh right 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 totally totally <laughs> totally yes. yeah and there's a lot more evidence uh beyond that uh for the fact that so for people who haven't played elden ring uh america and radagon they're the same person uh, essentially and you meet them at the end of the game and they're gods and you know the whole union of opposites thing um and the rebus in alchemy was sort of a personification of the philosopher's stone, 
which, you know, is the philosopher's stone is the source of eternal life. It is a divinity in and of itself. Uh, yeah. So that yeah. that's one of many examples. Uh, I could also get into how they use mercury and like the tree of Prima from Al- It's There's so much there. Yeah, man. I can't, we, that was another thing we touched on really briefly was, was Mercury, Hermes, Hermes, Trice, Magistus, Thoth. Man, that's, that, that is a great example to me of the, the more mundane version of the story that these ideas are being seeded, not by some, you know, hidden hand that's really perpetuating them, but just by people's natural curiosity. And these ideas have a sort of natural gravity well to them. Because I've been like, I just did a guy's podcast who's a jujitsu black belt, former MMA fighter, has no content whatsoever like what we're talking about. And he specifically asked me if I'd, if I'd come onto his podcast to talk about Hermes Trice Magistus. <laughs> and I gladly was like, yeah, but how the fuck did you get here? Like, like what, what, what made you A, reach out to me as the authority on this and B, how did you get interested in this? Like, like, you know, and it's just kind of what you'd expect. It's like, I don't know, man, I've just heard about it. I've read about it in sources X, Y, and Z. I've seen it referred to here and there. And I'm just so curious about what it is and, and who it is and what it means. And we all start our journeys in weird ways, man. For yeah. me, it was video games. Yeah. And, and I think likewise too, when I asked you the question of the first game you ever played that, you know, really sucked you in and made you curious about the deeper goings on, I remember the very first RPG I ever played very clearly. I still own it, actually. And it was Lunar Silver Star Story for Sega CD. Hmm. <laughs> and it's it's like kind of your standard JRPG. Um, the kind of twist is that it's called Lunar. So you actually li- literally live on the moon. And the Earth is sort of like the moon of the moon, in a, in a way. Uh, okay. Um, but yeah, you know, I have no doubt that there's chem- alchemical undertones to that too, being on the moon, you know, literally in the game, but it's it's very earth-like. It's not like it doesn't feel like you're on the moon. There's like forests and, you know, ecosystems and stuff like that. But but yeah, and you know, just from there I was just mystified and and hypnotized that oh, I need to play this. I need to go deeper into this and mm-hmm. um yeah, it never ended for me either, man. It's it's still still going to this day. And it's a I think it's a core part of my personal sense making apparatus to collect these ideas and have these ideas seeded through media and then mature those ideas like like you know st- stick them in the alchemical beaker so to speak and see what bubbles up and see how it changes over time and it just mm-hmm. keeps getting richer and richer through new media through conversations like this through content like what you produce and then where that leads me can yeah. can i ask you a question uh sure. what would you say is the quintessential media that uh really had the greatest influence on you in regards to all this stuff like one single game or movie or yeah, yeah. it's hard to say man it's really so hard good to ones. boil it down to one but i think it has to be the sort of, it's, it's funny to put it this way, but the sort of corpus of JRPGs, I think is the sort of like, <clears throat> the thing that really got me interested in the more esoteric and that whole kind of language. Because I, and I'm not, I don't think I'm even sure when I first, kind of like you with synchronicity, I don't think I'm sure where I first encountered these ideas. It was just like constellating connections over time yeah and then you find your way back to the primary material eventually and you're like oh this is where this comes from but then you Mm -hmm. figure out that that's not even where it came from that it came from something else and then you eventually get to some missing source that probably went up in flames in the library of alexandria or (laughs) some oral tradition that goes back to before things were written down or whatever you know it's like I, I'm not really yeah. sure. I mean, I can definitely point to like that game was definitely one. I know one of the first examples of a like classic hero's journey that I ever read was, um, have you ever seen the St. George and the Dragon children's book? No, I, no, sorry. 
it's amazing because it's like incredibly beautifully illustrated. Like it won that like Caldecott medal or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's your standard story of a, a knight slaying a dragon and, you know, dying and resurrecting and all of these different things. And I, I was just, again, just enraptured by that story. And I would always pick it up every time I, we, I went to the library and, and look through it. So, but yeah, I, I wish I had a better answer for you on like a single most influential piece. No, that's okay. I, I got a general idea though. JRPGs, uh, especially the aforementioned Xenogears, are wonderful sources. It's it's strange, isn't it? Like somebody pointed this out to me the other day. Like, why do you think the Japanese? Because there's so many Japanese examples mm -hmm. of media that make use of Western esoteric symbolism. Like, yes, why do they do that? Well, yeah, it's another, so yeah. Yeah, well, another great example that we haven't even mentioned yet is like Persona and Shin Megami Tensei. Yes. And those games. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so Jungian and so esoteric. But um, I can tell you that I don't, well, I don't know the answer to your question, but I can tell you that I, I lived there for a year, actually. And I oh. was surprised by how into the occult they are. Like they are definitely, like you will definitely find books about... Um, like just different kinds of divination and they love psychics and fortune tellers and they definitely are steeped in Jungian ideas as well. So it may be just kind of similar to us, but at the end of the day, I'm not sure either. Like, I don't know like how Western esoteric ideas really penetrated their, their consciousness either. Yeah. I'm, I wonder why it's not the reverse like I, you don't often see like uh, concepts like the Chinese Wu Jing make their way into the uh, the the Western media, <laughs> which is too bad because there's a lot of really cool ideas there. But it's definitely the case for them. Maybe that's uh, something I can look into yeah. at some point. That's a there's a like a a thesis, like a graduate thesis there or something. How, how <laughs> those ideas. Uh, it's penetrated the Japanese consciousness. That's really interesting. But hey, man, I know you got a time limit here, so we can wrap it up. But this has been fantastic. Yeah. I love just weaving, weaving this web together with you and honestly just nerding out about so many similar interests. Um, mm -hmm. So it's been great, man. It's been really great. Oh, thanks for talking. Like, it's been an absolute pleasure, dude. It's hard to... Yeah, we, I, we were also talking about this. It's hard enough to... Um before the show uh, it's hard enough to find people that share common interests in regards to stuff like this and it's even harder to produce content like this for an audience that will listen to it uh but when you find them it's uh it's a great pleasure it's like yes. discovering the actual philosopher's stone for yourself it is true it is true man because you're like i said at the top we're bringing we're bringing our two minds together and for a little bit at least we're making some kind of weird epi epiphenomenal little uh philosopher's stone of conversation or, or something or something and there's so much more that we we needed to talk about we didn't even get to full metal alchemist which i know, I know you man. wanted to talk about i know well i'm i'm definitely happy to have you back if you want to do it again hell yeah man name the all day right. sounds great brother all right we'll wrap this